Sometimes literally one win is all it takes to get yourself some serious fan hype and attention in MMA, but it's what you do with it next that usually matters. While it might catapult you to the top of the sport, most of the time your reward is going to be harder and harder competition. And unfortunately for some fighters, they may have been able to put on that one singular shocking performance and get all the eyes on them. but were then just never able to show that level of quality again. Or after scoring the biggest win of their career, they decided to just walk away entirely. Separate entirely. Yes, Mac. I'm Balian from MMA On Point. Big shout out to you MMA OP Hall of Famers out there. Thank you for supporting the channel. We really appreciate you guys. And these are the 10 biggest one fight wonders in MMA history. Number 10, Elvis Sinosik. I know that Australia is a hotbed of MMA these days, but way back in the 90s, I mean, they had barely entered the MMA world. The whole movement was pioneered, really, by one guy who ended up having a lot of firsts. That man's name was Elvis Sinosik. He fought on the first ever Australian MMA show and won the first ever Australian MMA title, the Aussie Valet Tudo Heavyweight Championship. But in 2000, he got another first, being the first Australian to compete in an MMA fight at K1, and he took a massive step up in competition because he had to fight Frank Shamrock. And this was the guy who had just been called the greatest champion in UFC history. He just literally left the UFC, and Elvis, well, he was only three and two in his MMA career. Still, he went the distance with Frank. To put that in context, not a single man in the UFC was able to make it the distance with him, not even Tito Ortiz. So even in a loss, this was still considered impressive at the time. And it got Elvis a chance again to be the first Australian in the UFC. His opponent though, Jeremy Horn, which if you know your UFC history, is not an easy fight. Jeremy was 45 and nine with tons of legit wins over credentialed guys, including choking out Chuck Liddell and taking Randy Couture the distance. This guy was at the top of the heat. Elvis was just three and three, but none of that meant anything to Sinisic. About 30 seconds in, Elvis pulled guard, and in just two minutes, he threw up a triangle armbar and tapped one of the most experienced fighters in the UFC. Elvis Sinisic! and you just submitted one of the finest grapplers in the world. And it looked like Elvis was about to put Australian MMA on the map. I mean, it was so impressive that he then became the first Australian to challenge for a world title. They gave him a shot at Tito Ortiz, the light heavyweight champion. Problem was, it was quite literally the worst stylistic matchup he could ask for. I mean, he pulled guard again, and then Tito just smashed him apart in three minutes with just devastating ground to pound. And to make things worse, Elvis would then lose his next three fights in a row. And when he did get back into the UFC many years later, he again lost both of those fights. Given just how impressive the win over Jeremy Jeremy Horn was, and the fact that people thought he was now going to usher in an entire new generation of MMA, I don't think many people would have predicted he'd end up at 7, 11, and 2 at the end of his career. It's no doubt that with just one win, he became a UFC name. Of course, he would be a bit higher in this list because of how good it was, but there weren't too many eyes on the sport back then. Number 9, Crone Gracie. Obviously, you don't have to be much of an MMA fan to know about the Gracie family and their legacy in the UFC. The time has come for us to introduce the first series on the basics of Gracie Jiu Jitsu. If they want to take me on, <laughs> I like that because that puts me at the number one. On the day they don't care about me anymore, I'll be concerned. I'm not a fighter. I believe in Jiu Jitsu. I believe Jiu Jitsu is a self defense art. But after like the early 2000s, we kind of just stopped seeing them compete in MMA at all, let alone win major titles or UFC championships. Don't get me wrong, they were still around, but they were far removed from their glory days. But the name still carried a lot of weight, and one of the most legendary graces had been Hickson. He was the guy featured in the infamous Choke documentary. And when it was then announced that his youngest son, Crone, was coming to the UFC, I mean, a lot of the fan base were pretty fucking excited. Or at the very least, intrigued if the Gracie magic still existed. Crone hadn't had a ton of fights, but he won them all, including a win over Tatsuya Kawajiri in Ryzen, but that had also been three years before his debut. He was booked against longtime UFC guy Alex Caceres. Bruce Leroy Alex was going to be a good test for Crone and give us a good idea of how legit this guy might be. And he answered all those questions and more because it took him two minutes to walk Alex down, get to his back, and then sink in just a textbook Gracie rear naked choke. That's a performance of the night right there, sir. Literally couldn't have gone any better. And what a showcase. Fans were so 
excited we might be able to witness another Gracie era starting to take place in the UFC. Imagine the headlines. Son of the best Gracie ever is now in the UFC and he's winning. They gave him Cub Swanson next though and he had the skills to stop the grappling and what we saw was a 15 minute beatdown and 40 of some of the sickest body shots ever thrown in the UFC. It was a big setback. He lost a lot of hype almost immediately and he could have bounced back, but then we didn't see him in the octagon for basically another four years. Talk about just killing your own hype drain. When he did come back, he looked even less evolved than he had in the Swanson fight. This time it was Charles Jourdain that just sat in his guard and beat him up without any real submission attempts from the Gracie. And we haven't seen him since. As it stands, he has that one immaculate win over Bruce Leroy, and that's pretty much it. It had been enough to capture fans' imagination, but then he was immediately exposed as not being well-rounded enough to compete with the best. And when you look back on paper, it's not really that big of a win, is it? It was certainly celebrated at the time, but that's why he's here at number nine. Number eight, Gokhan Saki. All the promos and hype packages along with Joe Rogan did a great job on selling us why we should give a shit when Gokhan Saki arrived in the UFC. He had the nastiest left hand. He would throw like left hook, left hook, left hook. You know, like left yeah. hook to the body, left hook to the head, left hook to the body, like bang, bang, bang. You know, like fast as fuck for a, and for a heavyweight. Ridiculous hand speed. He was boosted to the freaking moon. We all quickly found out about his 83 and 12 kickboxing record that also included 59 knockouts, multiple world championships in glory and K1, just one of the most badass and decorated strikers of all time. The community was hyped. All we needed now was just to see him fight and then we were all ready to freak out. In 2017, he took on Henrique da Silva in the UFC and everything he was throwing was landing and he even stopped a bunch of takedowns. And then he topped it off with a walk off KO and and a performance of the night bonus. Light heavyweight looked like it had a new contender. People were ready to believe he could be the best striker in the division. But given what happened next, I mean, you can look back now and say he was one of the guys whose abilities was massively overestimated. Be ready, motherfuckers. I'm coming. I'm here. I'm here to take over. I'm here to knock people out. This is what people want to see. The UFC even set him up with a pure striker, Khalil Roundtree. We thought we were going to see the rise of Gokan Saki, but instead in 90 seconds, he was absolutely flatlined. But he could bounce back, right? Well, wrong actually, because he never fought in the UFC again. To be fair, he was literally 33 years old, but he is a literal one hit wonder. One great performance of the night, and then we never got to see him again. He did blow up though, and even now he's still in the UFC video game, but the quality of his opponent and the time people actually spent hyping him was relatively short, so it doesn't put him much higher in this video. Number seven, Zach Freeman. As MMA fans, we're always on the hunt for the next big thing, the next top prospect. And if you want to wind the clock back to 2017, a ton of people were talking about Aaron Pico. I can't recall the last time someone's debut, not promotional debut, but actual official debut, pro debut, received this kind of attention. The work has been done. You've done everything you possibly can. You're the w most well-prepared debut ever probably in history. So that's I have a, a lot of confidence in that. This guy had been wrestling since he was four years old, won multiple national and international championships, was also a two-time junior world champion. But not only that, he was going to make his debut, his first fight ever, on the biggest pay-per-view Bellator had ever put on but he needed an opponent, and Bellator went outside the promotion and found this guy called Zach Freeman. Feels like you have a bit of a chip on your shoulder. I do, you know, only because no one would take this fight. You should hear some of the names they asked to fight him that said no. Really? And the reason was because they said, the guy's oh no, I have nothing to gain from it. Everyone who knows me or who's trained with me, and I go all over the country training, Zach Freeman is not one to take lightly, you know? I feel a little disrespected. Guarantee if you know his name now, it's only because of what happened next. And even though this was Pico's debut, there were so many eyes on him that what Zach Freeman did got him a ton of attention. And it was supposed to be a safe challenge for their future homegrown star. In less than 30 seconds, the hype train had already been derailed. Easily the most high profile win of Freeman's career. It shook the fan base and the news headlines that the super prodigy Pico had been defeated by an unknown fighter was absolutely devastating. Great news for Zach though, right? He's now in the spotlight. Let's do something with him. Unfortunately, he'd lose his next fight by TKO. As he was coming in, it was this shot right behind the ear. He never recovered from it. And then he never fought again. 
So yeah, one big win over this super prospect, gets tons of attention, one week of fame, and then he went back into the obscurity he kind of came from. Aaron had been super hyped, but it was pretty early in his career. If the win streak had been a bit longer, maybe Zach would be a bit higher in this list. Number six, Cosmo Alexandre. We've seen fighters transition from kickboxing to MMA, but not many guys kind of bounce between both at the same time. Cosmo had been kickboxing since 2004, and along the way, he won numerous world championships, even beat big names like John Wayne Park. Checks the low kick, and it's over now. And it's good night, Irene. Cosmo Alexander goes through, and devastated Wayne Park bows out due to injury. In 2011, he started doing MMA fights as well. And over the next five years, he had seven fights, only ever losing one. And when one championship started doing basically every martial art in one show, he fit nicely on their roster. Round, a much better round for Cosmo lands the uppercut, gets a knockdown on top two. Let's take a look at the finish right there again with the oh, uppercut. But at this point, even among the hardcore fans, I mean, he wasn't well known. He hadn't really beaten anyone of note or even been in a high profile fight. In 2019 though, one acquired UFC Wonderboy Sage Northcutt, an actual possible star that they might foster into someone that could pull viewers into their promotion. Just talking about it, it's gonna be uh, May 17th in Singapore. Uh, looks like my opponent's gonna be Cosmo Alexander. Oh, is this an MMA fight? MMA fight. But whoever the matchmaker was, no, I still don't know what they were thinking. One took the 23-year-old 11-2 Sage and gave him Cosmo the kickboxer with, uh, yeah, as many knockouts as years Northcutt had been alive. 23 KOs. And what happened next went so viral that it gives Cosmo a spot basically halfway up this list. In there with people that want to grapple with him. Cosmo! 30 seconds was all it took for Cosmo to absolutely shatter Northcutt's face with a monster shot that fractured it in eight places. Tons of people were watching to see what Sage was going to do in one, but instead it meant the knockout went absolutely viral in the community. When Cosmo destroyed him, suddenly everyone was now instead excited about this devastating 8 and one kickboxer instead. But he uh, never fought in MMA again after that win. And he waited three years before he even had another kickboxing fight. He went from obscurity going into the fight, maximum hype, and then right back to the unknown. You want to talk about a one-hit wonder? This is a one-punch wonder right here. And one basically got nothing out of this fight. Two stars died that night. Number five, Joe Duffy. Sometimes no matter what you do, your entire career is defined or remembered for just one win, especially if it's a win over the biggest star ever, Conor McGregor. Now, way back in 2010, the local Irish MMA scene was going through a bit of a boom and talent and promotions like Cage Warriors were putting on big shows. Among these talents was Joseph Duffy, a true Irish prodigy with a Taekwondo, Jiu Jitsu and boxing background. He'd run through the local scene and at the same time, Conor McGregor had started his own MMA journey and Cage Warriors thought it would be perfect for their show in court Island. At this level, I feel I can go out and do anything. I can feel I can, I can fight any way I want. Connor's ground game hadn't really developed enough at that point, though, and Joe made super quick work of the future champ champ. Fast stance, the more Eastern European boxing style of Joe he's Duffy. He's got a fast submission. Yeah, he's got very good control. And he's, he tapped him. That was a very, him. very fast submission there. At the time, it was impressive, of course, especially amongst the Irish fans and media. And Joe moved to 7-0, looking like the country's best prospect. Expect him to be that quick? No, you can never be expect him to be quick. Just glad to get the job done. A title he could never live up to, and instead it was a victory that just followed and defined him for years. Connor, after that loss, vowed to never let it happen again and started his epic run towards UFC gold. Before he won the interim title though and was climbing to the top of the MMA world, Joe Duffy arrived in the UFC and yeah, you guessed it. The entire narrative was, this guy is the last man to beat Conor McGregor. No, I changed my name to the last guy to beat Conor McGregor. I think yeah. that seems to be the title everyone puts on me. Joe won his first two UFC fights and actually in both looked incredibly impressive. Even Dana White was going crazy for this kid. Is there any other, is there any Irish fighters who think of a realistic chance of a title shot? Again, outside Conor, obviously. Yeah, I, Duffy. I mean, the, the, the two best fighters I've seen out of Ireland right now. However, though, Joe would never get close to a UFC title shot. After those two wins, he next got Dustin Poirier on a pay-per-view and was just outmatched by the more experienced fighter. He managed to bounce back with two wins after that, but ultimately ended his UFC run on a three-fight losing streak and then decided to retire. For Duffy, his entire career is now remembered and was defined by that one win he got over Conor McGregor. And even though it was many years before casual fans knew who he was, it's still the biggest victory on his record over the biggest name. And it was an achievement that he could just never repeat in the octagon. But at the time, 
time in the UFC, it was such a narrative in the community and gave him so much hype that he never lived up to that it has to be this high up in the list. Number four, Ricky Bandeas. At one point, although Bellator's pay-per-view stars were mainly made up of ex-UFC fighters looking for a payday, they had quite a few young guys on their roster who looked like they could be top, top prospects. Now, one of these guys in 2018 was a young Irishman named James Gallagher. And of course, fans immediately compared him to Conor McGregor, and they weren't exactly wrong. What makes you different to McGregor, both in terms of personality and as a fighter? Well, Conor is Conor. I am James. Do you know what I mean? They are totally two different people. At bantamweight, he enters as an undefeated professional. Seven victories. Distance and the timing that is needed to cover that distance. Oh, the young stop. <laughs> he was just 19 when he joined Bellator and was a product of SBG Dublin, Connor's gym, and he started running through Bellator featherweights, picking up four wins with three of them by rear naked choke. He had personality, he had lots of tattoos, and Conor McGregor was also behind him. Uh, nice for some, eh? <laughs> Jimmy Boy, yeah? <laughs> now, he was one of the guys on the short list of fighters outside the UFC that fans were actually paying attention to. But a lot of people also said that the hype was getting to his head, especially with what happened when he fought the relatively unknown Ricky Bandeas. Ricky had spent his time exclusively on the regional scene and in promotions like CFFC. He was 10 and 1, but he was clearly ready for a bigger promotion. Bellator thought he'd be a great opponent for James, but it became one of those moments that's often memed by the MMA community, and it went so viral that's why he's up here at number four in the video. James came out looking incredibly cocky, getting right in Ricky's face. Hailing from Strumpon, introducing Ireland's own James. But once the fight started, it all ended pretty quick. Ricky was now 11 and 1, had just creamed one of the best featherweight prospects in Bellator. Because of all the cockiness, the way he knocked him out, and the fact he'd taken the next Conor McGregor's O, the win trended massively amongst the community. But it meant that it was only top competition from here, and for this dude, he just wasn't able to compete. He ended up dropping losses to Juan Archuleta immediately afterwards, and then he got choked out by Patchy Mix in just one minute. All the eyes that Ricky had got on himself just completely drifted away at that point, and he could just never find success again against high-level guys. In fact, he only won two of his next six fights before leaving Bellator, and now in 2024, he's 15 and 8, never quite beating anyone with the level of credibility that viral win gave him. In fact, I would rank it higher because of that reason, but of course, James hadn't done too much of his career at that point. Number three, Houston Alexander. The UFC know what they're looking for in a contender at this point. You've got to be well-rounded, you've got to be young as well, and you definitely need to be able to compete at a relatively high level. But back in the day, it felt like if you looked like a big scary motherfucker, well, that could be 50% of your contract right there. And in 2007, that's where guys like Houston Alexander came in. Now, yes, the guy had just murdered the regional scene with some terrifying knockouts. He was 6-1, and one, but could he do it at the highest level? Well, his first opponent was Keith Jardine, a veteran of the Ultimate Fighter, who'd gone 4-1 and one in the UFC and was coming off a pretty decent win over Forrest Griffin, certainly a light heavyweight prospect and better than anyone Alexander had faced. And no one really knew what to expect from this guy. His approach to fighting, now he was in the big show though, didn't change one bit. In a damn right shocking debut, he annihilated Keith's chin with just a relentless barrage, getting the KO in just 48 seconds. A tremendous upset and a tremendous victory for Houston Alexander. The fan base went absolutely crazy. I mean, they believed he already had so much power that he could be a threat to the entire division, even the champion. One of the most hyped guys ever after just one fight, that's for sure. And then he did it again in his next fight, knocking out Alessio Sakara. I mean, things were looking really promising with the power this guy had. Only problem was, he'd then lose his next three fights in a row, getting finished in every one of them, and got dropped basically a year after he joined the UFC. After such a promising start, he ended his MMA career 17-16-1, really far away from that 8-1 and one record he had in the UFC. And the Keith Jardine KO goes down as really his only big winning performance, but it caused such a frenzy among fans that he's so high up on this list. Of course, he'd find his true calling later in life, knocking more people out in bare knuckle. 
Number two, Timothy Nastyukin. If there's one guy who bet on himself and it consistently paid off in his career, it's Eddie, the underground king Alvarez. The guy just hopped from promotion to promotion, collecting titles like the Thanos of MMA. Once he'd won the UFC one, he'd kind of done all he needed to do, and after just four years of being in the promotion and a loss in a rematch with Dustin Poirier, he was already off looking for new opportunities. Just so happens at the time, One FC was starting to build their roster, and they offered him a sizable amount of cash to come out to Asia and join in the fun. The moment of truth has arrived. I knew you heard the rumor. And they are true. We got our official contract from 1FC. Without getting into detail, okay. the, the package in general, it's it's going to be an eight-figure deal. Whoa. Yeah, eight-figure eight fight deal. And in preparation, I left that shelf there empty. You guys know what that's for. But uh, things didn't exactly go to plan. Of course, being a former UFC champion, his debut in one was watched by tons of fans that would never have tuned into a show otherwise. Eddie's opponent was Timothy Nastukin, who had gone 5-3 and three in one with some fairly decent wins, but also some pretty tough losses. To most fans and media, it seemed like he wouldn't be a problem at all, especially because this was the opening round of a tournament he was supposed to win. Alvarez outside back, it's straight right hand down the center there from Nastukin. And Alvarez... I had no idea who this guy was, but shit, after that, I was paying attention. Timothy was now the new top prospect in one. I am stunned. Just upset the underground king. However, he pretty much lost all of his hype immediately. The win over Eddie pushed him towards a shot at the lightweight championship against Christian Lee, but he got absolutely steamrolled and TKO'd in just over one minute by the champion. It just crumbled him and then started hitting him over and over again. Those finishing instincts are unreal from Christian Lee. Ouch. Yeah, not the performance everyone was expecting. And after that, well, pretty much everyone just stopped paying attention entirely. And before you knew it, he was on a four-fight losing streak miles away from the guy who'd beaten a former UFC champion. It ended up being the most noteworthy achievement of his career, and then he just wasn't able to do anything after that. How about an honorable mention for Nico Montano? She got one win, a big one, the UFC championship. Real flash in the pan for Nico Montano, but I guess also not that many people were too hyped about how it all went down. Number one, Brett Rogers. So this performance at number one was, and still is for some, kind of legendary. But these days, unless you were around for the Strike Force era, you might probably have never heard of Mr. Brett Rogers. At six foot five and every bit 265 pounds, Brett, in true movie backstory fashion, won his first nine fights all by KO in the first round. Of course, most of those guys didn't have Wikipedia pages, but in 2009, he joined Strike Force and he went from changing garage tires to getting to fight a former UFC champion by the name of Andre Arlovsky. The Pitbull had just been on a five-fight win streak after dropping a loss to Fedor and was now coming into Strike Force. So he was certainly the biggest name Brett had ever faced and had a lot of hype still behind him. But Rogers disregarded all of that. He just rushed Andre from the opening bell and in 22 seconds knocked him the fuck out. So this guy was immediately catapulted from near obscurity to a place amongst the top, top heavyweights in Strike Force. If you looked at his record, you saw 10-0 all first round knockouts. Problem is, you knock out a former UFC champ and you're only gonna get high level opponents from there. Opponents like, well, perhaps the greatest heavyweight of all time at that point, Fedor Emelianenko, who was also making his own Strike Force debut. So yeah, a massive, massive step up, but Brett was confident he'd knock him out and KO him like he had everyone else. Not to sound cocky or anything, it'd definitely be a fun fight. I'm definitely gonna test his chin, but when it comes down to it, you know, if he doesn't have a chin, that's a wrap. But with one jab, he busted up Fedor's nose and then it just turned into a wild heavyweight back and forth fight, ultimately ending in the second round with one massive right hand from Fedor that put Brett's lights out. It was only his first loss, but it just all went downhill from there. Still up there with the best strike force heavyweights, he only kept getting top competition. Alastair Overeem, Josh Barnett, guys that Brett just couldn't compete with. Two years after Fedor, he'd lost another three fights and unfortunately was never able to beat another high-level opponent like he had in Andrei Arlovsky. Any belief that he was going to be this unbeatable, incredible knockout machine and continue perhaps one of the greatest KO streaks ever 
completely evaporated. Fans had lost total interest after seeing him consistently beaten. He continued to trade wins and losses, eventually ending his career at 17, 10, and 1. But it had been such a legendary winning performance in the middle of such an amazing streak that he has to go down as the biggest one-hit wonder ever. Well, this one turned into a bit of a fun video. I want to say a big thank you as well, as always, to all of you channel members out there who subscribe, go the extra mile to support the channel. If you want to sign up and join them and get some exclusive benefits as well, link is in the description. If you did like it, thumbs up is always appreciated. And if you're not subscribed, the button's right there and we'll see you in the next one.